All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Neurotechnologies webinar series. I will be your moderator for this session. Today's webinar is basic frequency analysis for physiology. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the session, please type them in the questions box on your screen. I will compile the questions and ask them to the presenter at the end of the presentation. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chris Pulliam, Senior Biomedical Research Engineer, who will be presenting today. Thank you, Lisa. So if we toss out the term physiological signals, three good examples that come to mind are ECG, EMG, and EEG. All are bioelectric signals generated by the body's excitable tissues. The goal for today is to briefly introduce relevant topics for, from sampling theory, as well as basic techniques for analyzing these signals in the frequency domain and applying digital filters. One of the earlier webinars gave a general introduction to the data acquisition process. The bioradio can be used on the front end to acquire signals. Today we'll discuss some important parameters to consider when you're doing the acquisition and then what you can do once you've collected the signals. In order to analyze a signal on a computer, you have to convert it from an analog or continuous signal into a digital or discrete signal that a computer can store. This process is called sampling. And what happens is that the continuous signal is stored every t seconds. This gives us what is called a sampling frequency, which is the inverse of the sampling interval t. So the next thing to consider is how we go about selecting the sampling frequency. Here we have a 1 hertz continuous sine wave shown in blue. In red are the discrete samples at three different sampling frequencies. Sampling at 1 hertz, shown on the left, our digitized signal doesn't look at all like the sine wave. Sampling at 2 hertz, shown in the middle, we capture the basic oscillations of the sine wave, but the morphology is not captured. If we increase the sampling frequency to 20 hertz, the, the discrete samples fit the sine wave pretty well. This phenomenon, when different signals become indistinguishable, is called aliasing. Here we have a higher frequency continuous sinusoid, sinusoid shown again in blue. When we sample this signal with a frequency that's too low, the digitized signal can end up looking like a totally different sine wave of a lower frequency. So now that we've identified a significant problem with not sampling fast enough, how do we go about selecting the sampling rate? The Nyquist rate is two times the bandwidth of a signal and serves as a lower bound for the sample rate for alias-free signal sampling. For example, let's assume your transducer or data acquisition unit, such as the bioradio, includes an analog low-pass filter with a cutoff of 100 Hz. The Nyquist criteria would require sampling at at least 200 Hz. Depending on the application, sampling faster than the Nyquist rate is advisable. But hardware and, and memory typically impose some practical limitations on how quickly you can sample. Once we have our signals recorded, we have a lot of options for analyzing them. We can learn a lot about the signals by plotting them and visualizing them in the time domain. But sometimes, frequency analysis allows us to learn additional information. So let's introduce a few more concepts. If we focus on the left side of this slide, we have an arbitrary signal x that is a sum of two different sine waves of different frequencies and amplitudes. Looking at it, we can probably estimate the frequencies and amplitudes of these sine waves. But using an operation called the Fourier transform, we can look at x as a function of frequency rather than, than as a function of time. If we look on the right side of the slide, we have the Fourier transform. On the x-axis is frequency, and on the y-axis is the magnitude of the Fourier transform. Here it's very obvious that the signal has two components, one at 5 hertz and one at 20 hertz, indicated by peaks in the frequency spectrum. The ratio of the amplitudes of these peaks can even tell us about the relative amplitudes of these signals in the time domain. 
Digital filters are a good concept to introduce in the frequency domain. They can be used to remove unwanted noise and artifacts. There are several categories, such as low-pass filters, which pass the lower frequencies and reject or attenuate higher frequencies. High-pass filters are sort of the opposite in that they pass the higher frequencies and attenuate the lower frequencies. Bandpass filters pass a range of frequencies, and bandstop or notch filters attenuate a specified range of frequencies, passing signals above and below these cutoffs. All of these filters are parameterized by cutoff frequencies, which define the pass and stop bands, as well as a filter order, which defines how quickly the filter transitions from the pass band to the stop band. Now, we've been kind of discussing things in terms of sines and cosines, but physiological signals are usually much more com complex than that. Luckily, they can still be represented as a sum of sinusoids of different frequencies. This representation is referred to as a Fourier series. And basically what this means is that any generic signal um, represented here, a signal of T, can be represented as a weighted sum of sines and cosines. Using Fourier series representation, we can decompose any signal into sums and cosines and then use the concepts that we've been discussing so far to analyze signals. And in the frequency domain, these approaches are particularly useful to gain insight into biological processes. Now, if we look at examples of how frequency analysis can be applied, I've already done some analysis on some EMG data and EEG data that I collected last week. We'll step through those two examples, and then we'll do some live analysis on ECG data in MATLAB. Here on the left, we have some raw EMG data that was kept collected from the biceps muscle during an isometric force task. The subject tried to maintain a constant level of force for 200 seconds. There aren't any obvious trends when we look at the data in the time domain on the left. In the frequency domain, however, we can make some pretty interesting observations. Specifically, if we calculate the Fourier transform on small windows of this, within this 200 second trial, and then plot the median frequency throughout the trial, we can see that as time elapses, the frequency is actually decreasing. And we, this actually can tell us something about motor recruitment or an underlying bio motor control process. If we think about EEG analysis, the activity is typically described in terms of the power contained in various frequency bands. Changes in the power in these bands can be used to make inferences about the level of consciousness or diagnose seizure disor disorders. On the left, we have a raw EEG signal that was recorded with the bioradio. In order to isolate the various frequency bands, I wrote some code in MATLAB that passed the raw signal through several digital filters whose cutoffs were set to match those on this slide. In a few minutes, we'll do a live demo of how we can build a filter in MATLAB to identify and eliminate noise. But this is just an example of how those filters can be applied to EEG data. So we have different, several different bands that we may be potentially interested in observing. The spectrogram is a tool that we can use to observe how the frequency spectrum changes over time. So in this example, we have on the x-axis, time on the x-axis, and frequency on the y-axis. The lower range, 0 to 4 hertz, corresponds to the delta band, and the upper range, 30 to 50 hertz, corresponds to the gamma band. And the, the color corresponds to the power at each of these frequencies. So again, we have a tool that we can use to visualize data, and it makes it easy to make observations across all of the frequency bands and across time at the, simultaneously. So now we'll try to do a live demonstration of how you can apply some of the concepts we've discussed. I'll show you the bioradio and how it can be used to capture ECG data through the biocapture software package. And then we'll do some additional processing in MATLAB. So the bioradio is a data acquisition device that has eight differential and programmable channels. It com communicates with a Bluetooth receiver about the size of a flash drive and has a transmission range of about 100 feet. The biocapture software package makes it really easy to interface with the bioradio and export that data to CSV files. The 
Fire capture package can also do real-time Fourier transforms and some digital filtering. But again, we'll do a, a kind of a, um, a slightly more interactive demo in MATLAB to build our own filter. So if I step over. So here's what the bioradio actually looks like. Um, so as I mentioned, it has eight uh, differential programmable channels. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to use channel one to do a one lead ECG, kind of like as shown on the diagram on the slide. So under my shirt, I have two leads with SNAP connectors connected to the right and left side of my chest, and then I have a ground electrode connected to my hip bone. This is the biocapture package, so we can use it to connect and interface with the bioradio. Um, the bioradio can be programmed to acquire a number of different types of biopotentials, so including EEG, EMG, and EOG, as well as some other um, relevant signals and motion data. So we already have it connected, so if we start acquisition and adjust the y-axis a bit, So what we have is we have our, the, our one channel EEG signal. So again, this is being transmitted from the bioradio to the computer wires, wirelessly. Sorry, there's a little bit of noise from EMG uh, from the chest muscles. Um, so this can be used to you know, do heart rate and some basic um, arrhythmia analysis. The biocapture package also has the ability to do real-time Fourier transforms, which is as simple as doing a double click. And it also has some integrated filters for getting rid of noise. Now I have some pre-recorded data in MATLAB that's stored in, already stored in a MATLAB format. So it's easy to export data from BioCapture through, in, from BioCapture into CSV files, and then these are easily loadable into MATLAB. So if I load this data, I have a noisy ECG signal a time vector. So let's plot that. Okay. So what we have is a an ECG signal that's been corrupted by 60 hertz noise. So we can maybe still pick out some of the QRS complexes and maybe we'd be able to estimate the heart rate, but there's not a whole lot else that we'll be able to do in the time domain. So we might be interested in trying to get rid of a lot of this noise. One way that we can do that, or a first step may be to look at the Fourier transform. So in MATLAB, the command FFT uses the, or calculates the Fourier transform using um, the fast Fourier transform, which is a computationally efficient algorithm for um, estimating the Fourier transform. And I also use the absolute value to take the magnitude of that. In order to plot it, we want to generate a frequency vector, and then we'll actually look at this signal in the frequency domain. So here's the Fourier transform with frequency on the x-axis and the magnitude of the Fourier transform on the y-axis. And you can see we have this giant peak right at 60 hertz. So what we'll do is we'll try to design a filter to kind of reduce this peak and see if we get a cleaner signal. In order to do that, um, we have a lot of options for designing filters, um, especially in MATLAB. Um, so you can design a Chevy Chef or a Butterworth filter. For today's demo, we'll just use a Butterworth filter. Um, it's a pretty general um, all-around filtering technique for filter design. And we'll set the cutoffs to be 55 and 65 hertz, so we'll kind of do a, a narrow band stop filter. Um, this is normalized to half of the sampling frequency, and again, we'll use a stop. So that gives us our filter parameters, and the next thing we'll do is actually calculate or filter the raw the raw data. So the filter function applies the filter using the coefficients we just defined to our original vector. 
and then we'll actually calculate the Fourier transform of that filtered data. And then plot it as well. So we'll bring up that previous figure for comparison. So on the left, we have our original Fourier transform. We have that giant peak at 60 hertz, which was representative of 60 hertz electrical noise. On the right, we have the same signal after it's been filtered. And you notice that there isn't a peak at 60 hertz. So we were able to successfully filter out that, that noise. If we go back to the time domain and plot this signal, we can now actually see the QRS complex as well as the P and T waves. So we're able to maybe do some morphology analysis on this and, and do some more advanced um, analysis. So if you have any additional questions, please enter them into the dialog box and I'll try to answer them. Um, if we don't get to them here, uh, we can follow up with you later. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Number one, are there ways to do frequency analysis without MATLAB? Um, yes, there are. So if you want to build up a custom solution, one way to do that might be to use C or Java or one of the other well-known, well-established programming languages. Um, there are several libraries that are publicly available for these programming languages that you could use, that you can incorporate into your own code to do frequency analysis. Um, another higher level programming language is called Octave. It's a free program. It's more on the command level, uh, but it's very similar to MATLAB and has many of the computational uh, capabilities that MATLAB does. Okay, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please do type them into the questions box on your screen. Uh, one, uh, another question, what is the maximum sampling rate that the BioRadio supports? Um, the maximum sampling rate for the bioradio is 960 hertz. Um, so those eight programmable channels can be uh, sampled at um, anywhere from 128 up to 960 hertz. Okay, another question. I have tried FFT for EEG and it doesn't work well. Can you recommend anything? Um, so one of the issues with FFT um, is using or one of the ways that you can improve the resolution with EEG data is to um, record or analyze much wider windows. So it's a little bit outside the scope of what we discussed today. But the resolution in the frequency domain is related to the amount of time that you record in the time domain. So depending on your application, if you recorded a much longer trial, you may get increased resolution in the frequency domain, which may improve uh, your performance. Okay, does, a sampling, does sampling a signal with a sampling frequency significantly higher than Nyquist rate cause problems? Um, it doesn't really cause problems. Uh, it, it, in some ways, it, it's actually advantageous to sample beyond the, the Nyquist rate um, to kind of help avoid aliasing. Uh, the, the two things you probably would like to uh, at least be aware of when you're trying to exceed the Nyquist rate is that um, most data acquisition units have some maximum sampling frequency. So as I mentioned, the bioradio goes up to about just shy of one, one um, kilohertz. But any data acquisition unit is going to have a, um, an upper limit on how quickly it can sample. The second consideration is just memory limitations. So the, the faster you sample, the more space it takes to store your data. Um, memories, computer memory is pretty cheap these days, so it's not quite as much of an issue as it may have been in the past, but it, it's something else to consider. Okay, can the simple IR filters be used for decomposing the EEG to the five bands? Simple IR, yes, they can actually, they can. So sorry, it's a pretty short answer, but yes, they can. Okay, it looks like those are all the questions we have time for. If we did not uh, get to your question, we will follow up directly. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating. Uh, we'll be sending a link to a recording of this webinar out to you, uh, to everyone who's registered, and we hope to see you at a future webinar.